Well, thank you, Victor, for your nice uh, introduction. And uh, I remember um, being with Pedro Pan uh, people a few years ago. It was uh, in a school, I think. I don't know, it was the 20th or so anniversary. For sure, it was not this nice environment that you have here uh, today. Um, but uh, it was a nice opportunity to actually share uh, some of the studies that we have conducted. Um, I would say since uh, um, the late 60s, um, talking about uh, impact, as Carlos was saying, in connection with uh, Elian, one of the things that really impressed me very, very much being a student at the University of Florida was this famous case, I don't know how many of you remember that, of this young man, 19 years of age, uh, Carlos Socarras Ramirez. Anyone remembers that? Arrived alive to Madrid, Spain, uh, actually flying over the Atlantic in a DC-8. How many of you remember that, that case? Well, you probably have seen uh, this recent one, I think a month or two ago, that didn't have that luck. I remember seeing in the El País a uh, picture of this other young man that actually was hanging down dead before they actually took the corpse and so forth and make uh, an autopsy. Well, I would say that I was the first one to conduct a study of who the Balseros were, you know? Uh, of course, this was a, a very, very extreme case, the case of Carlos Ocarras, that they say was a case in a million, all right? Uh, and that triggered me also to um, question why they resort to this type of extreme avenue to leave Cuba. Why? What is there that prompts people to do that? And at that time, they were arriving in unbelievable things. As a matter of fact, I was tempted to bring one raft that I have kept at home. It's a plane in a tube, okay, where they have put a kind of a net underneath uh, to prevent them from slipping down uh, into the water and uh, this was one that made it. This is one that made it. And, well, why they do uh, that? Why we have that situation? Well, um, number one, I have been uh, inspired by the studies of the uh, Harvard Center for Russian Studies. I don't know if you are familiar with that. Uh, in the 50s, conducting studies, uh, trying to investigate the life in the Soviet Union through the people living uh, the Soviet Union. Well, uh, that was one source of uh, information that I, that I had. And besides that, of course, is my own personal experience. I was born in the late, uh, 30, in the late, late 30s, right? So I um, uh, had an experience. I always was highly motivated by the political uh, scene. I had a, an uncle of mine that was a minister in 1944, and uh, uh, I regret really not having interviewed him because he had some very, very interesting anecdotes. But the one that impressed me the most was that he told me about how he conducted business in the Ministry of Communication, and to some extent, you can say he was an exception because he was one that went there and didn't enrich himself, as many uh, had done uh, in this position and any other ones. And he said to me, in connection with this, as a being in Omiris Akin. He died about 90 uh, years of age. And that is something that I remember very, very much. The pre-Castro Cuba. And that's what we're going to talk a little bit, trying to summarize a little bit of, uh, well, the 50 years and uh, go into the present situation, which are another 52 years 
uh, that actually uh, nobody felt. I remember uh, back in the uh, early uh, 60s that uh, we never conceived that this would have remained uh, there for, for this long. Among other things, because we were all uh, impressed by the what we call the 90 mile myth. There couldn't be a communist system 90 miles from the United States. Well, we learn and we uh, really, unfortunately, uh, learned the hard way that that was a myth. And uh, one of the things that uh, I've learned in all this process is uh, to investigate what a totalitarian system is. I witnessed the dictatorship of Batista. I was involved in the struggle there at that time as my brother that was almost killed by a Batista henchman. And I myself was involved, I didn't get to that extreme. But I also witnessed it from uh, something that is very interesting experience in my life, and this is the vision of that year and a half uh, that I lived in Cuba and was old enough to see really what was going on. And then a little uh, personal experience living in the uh, El Castillo del Principe Heights. Everybody knows what that is? Yes. The Castillo del Principe Heights. Beautiful view from there, but certainly you don't want to live there, right? This was the prison that uh, was, was converted into a prison, was a castle in the, uh, from colonial times. And, and that gave me a, a very interesting perspective, not only in terms of the system, but in terms of life, okay? As uh, my uncle said about Asel being in Omiris at that point we didn't know if they were going to be executed. We were going to be there for 30 years. As you know, we eventually left as a result of Kennedy's um, arrangement, you can say, that they don't like to use the word ransom payment. But the fact is that I was worth $50,000 in aspirin and alka <laughs> and other goods that Castro got, and uh, well, was able to get out. And I felt, well, I have also a moral responsibility a moral responsibility with that Cuba that probably I will never go back, simply because I have my roots here now. My parents are buried here, my wife's parents are buried here, my uh, children were born here, my grandchildren are here as well. So, but I feel, and I agree 100% with what Carlos said, we all have a responsibility to produce a change. Well, going back to the pre-Castro Cuba, uh, we Cubans like to brag about how good Cuba was. And sometimes we say here, you know, uh, eso no pasaba en Cuba. <laughs> it seems that we tend to see sometimes here. Well, yes, uh, Cuba had, uh, you can say, a privileged position to a great extent connected with its geographical position and the United States. Okay, Cuba had probably the longest period of struggle for independence than any other country in Latin America. We don't have time for the statistics, but uh, certainly if we touch one or two, we realize how uh, that was the case. For instance, in terms of standards of living, especially in urban Cuba, uh, we were about the same as the United States. Okay, uh, in Cuba we uh, had uh, the first railroad system uh, uh, that not even Spain at that time had, uh, the first uh, color TV, etc., etc. We can mention many, many more, but I'm going to bother you with that. Indeed, we had a tremendous material development. Unfortunately, we didn't have as well the proper leadership development. Simón Bolívar said once, el talento sin probidad es un azote. 
talent without property is a disease. Or, uh, and that was true, very true. Cuba had a lot of talent, but unfortunately, we didn't have sufficient amount of good leadership that will give an example. And that's what I think the United States really is lucky to have. I don't know how many of you know, maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, that they tried to make George Washington king of the United States. Is that true? Okay, well, you know what happened. And he set the example for the, uh, the, the, the other generations and definitely set an example of how leadership should actually operate. Unfortunately, in spite of the political leadership, Cuba had advanced to the point, as I said, that was probably ahead of most countries in Latin America, or was first or second in terms of its uh, material development, and was able to recuperate from the disaster of the War of Independence that actually left Cuba in ruins. But as a result of the ingenuity of the Cuban people. And I have been in different countries, and I can tell you that typically Cubans in all those countries have moved ahead. It's that entrepreneurial drive that have actually uh, made Cuba prosper, but unfortunately again, and this is something that Cubans don't like to hear, we did not have the proper political leadership. We were advancing, indeed, in terms of uh, the, the political leadership and, you might say, the, the quality of government, but we had, unfortunately, a tremendous letdown when on March 10, 1952, that constitutional order that had been functioning since 1940 was broken by someone that actually contributed to the making of that constitutional order. Well, that coup d'etat generated, you could say, a process that on the one hand, some wanted to be a peaceful process of getting rid of that dictatorship that was an authoritarian dictatorship not a totalitarian dictatorship. And that's very important to have in mind because if you don't, you don't really understand, you can, we cannot really understand the desperation of those uh, uh, rafters, uh, the desperation of those who get into an inner will well of a DCA to uh, leave Cuba. Let's face it, at the time of Batista you could be neutral politically, and nothing will happen to you. Now, if you were plotting against the system and so forth, like the case of my brother, well, you will be risking getting killed, for sure. Right? But then comes a great tragedy. In this process of fighting for the restoration of democracy, came into the light this young lawyer born in Biran in 1926, called Fidel Castro. Be careful what I'm going to say now. He's a great leader, but a great bad leader, the same way that Hitler was a great leader, no questions about it. Castro, indeed, and I had the opportunity to face him and discuss and argue with him when we were in prison. He is a completely different type of leader that Cuba ever had, and probably there is no other in world history. You were saying in Latin America, in world history, there's no leader that has been there for 52 years. So one thing that we Cubans did was to underestimate this man. The right way to go would have been to have a peaceful transition. But Batista and his stubbornness prevented from happening. But what happened to the Cuban leadership? When I say Cuban leadership, I'm not talking about the political leadership only. That's very important. But I'm talking about the civic. I'm talking about the economic. I'm talking even about the religious leadership. 
Many of them knew who Cash was. And I don't have time to get into, into uh, the details here, but in our new edition of Cuba Mito Realidad, this 700-page book that we uh, had published in 90 and 92, we are now finishing the English version. We have a lot of anecdotes showing uh, precisely how we have been dealing with a social path. And I have taken the characteristic of sociopathy from the manual of the psychiatrists and so forth, and it's unbelievable how it fits perfectly the description of Fidel Castro and his conduct. And as I said, in that particular date in which he came to where we were, the Baja Tupers, he was very impressed with the Baja Tupers because we were the first unit to jump in combat in America, in combat, because remember, they have jumped many, 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 many times with the 82nd and so forth here. And he said to us, well, boys, how is the revolution treating you? Almost in a paternal way. And uh, I uh, told him, uh, Dr. Castro, well, look at this guy there in the corner. Uh, he's in very bad shape. I mean, he was something that, uh, I don't know, some kind of call or something. And you know what he answered? Oh, the thing is, he's, he's not grateful to the revolution, to the food that the revolution is give, has given him. <coughs> that was his response. Well, to make a long story short, uh, we uh, continued talking there. We spent about an hour talking with him. He was smoking the very last part of a cigar. I remember telling uh, uh, this guy that was with me there, we were trying to escape. There was never a surrender of the Brigade 25 or 6. Okay? People tried to disperse and tried to uh, escape. Well, this one that was with me during the, the Senega Zapata uh, effort to escape had a, a box of cigars. I said, well, uh, offer Dr. Castro. I always told him Dr. Castro uh, a cigar. And he said to us, no, 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 uh, this is the one that I like the most. The very cabrito del tabaco. <laughs> the very last portion of it. Well, again, to make a long story short, so we began to talk about the issue of the war, the issue of the philosophical aspects of the revolution. And uh, he said to us that he was a Marxist-Leninist since he was 19 years of age. And before that, he was an illiterate in politics. My belief it is that he is not a communist. He is a Castroist that have used the communist and have used anything that have come across, including the clown there in Venezuela that has a deep oil pocket, you know, for his own benefit. And he has been successful and played with, what, 11 uh, presidents of the United States, uh, practically driven the Soviet Union to bankruptcy. You know, they say that the Soviet Union poured into Cuba 10 times the Marshall Plan that was estimated at that time in about $10 billion. You made your calculations and you will see how he dilapidated that, that money, all right. By the way, he was a man, or he's a man, that never earned his living, nor his brother. He was always kept by his father, by the money his father was sending, who was a rich uh, Galician uh, uh, farmer uh, that uh, uh, always supported. He never had to go to work while the University of Florida, but had this tremendous ambition, tremendous determination that was definitely underestimated by that Cuban leadership. And that's our great sin of the Cuban people. Many believe that some of those leaders that went up to the Sierra Maestra, that actually knew very well who he was, should have never gone there. So this is what they call a betrayal of the intelligentsia, of the Cuban intelligentsia, that could have done something to prevent him from getting into power. And later on, in 1959, united 
their efforts with people who had moral authority to actually prevent this consolidation. That would have been the time to stop him. Again, we don't have time to elaborate into that. But let's go into 1959, 1960, very briefly. I do believe, as I said, that he is not a communist. He's a Castroist that has used the communists to his uh, intention of perpetuating himself in power, and probably he will die you know, in, in, in bed peacefully there. Okay? But, as I said, he used definitely the methodology, the resources. Remember that the resources, according to experts, have not been actually, uh, uh, you can say, um, accounted for. It, it poured millions and millions and millions of dollars to actually uh, 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 help him to remain in power. By mid-1960, I would say that it was impossible to actually uh, do anything peacefully against Castro. And that is exactly what is being done in Venezuela these days. I remember publishing an article entitled Venezuela, Cuba in slow motion. <coughs> and that's what's happening in Venezuela, really, in slow motion. Controlling the media, trying to control all the civic institutions, and inaugurating, you can say, populist programs. Like in the case of Cuba, who doesn't like to have his rent reduced in half, and so forth, a number of other very good measures that actually did not cost him anything. And then, of course, the whole confiscation, as I said, of the media, the whole control of the institutions, the students, etc. And, well, by mid-1960, it was impossible to do anything uh, peaceful. It had to be done, unfortunately, through the violent way. And that's how this episode of the Bay of Pigs actually took place. Uh, you know what happened. Uh, Mr. Kennedy got cold feet, and, and we were supposed to have, you know, the complete control of the air, and it was the opposite. He was the one that had the complete control of the air, okay? And like someone said uh, that uh, I think, uh, uh, well, he was the first one that actually landed there. Bay of Page was not defeated in Cuba. He was defeated in Washington. When Kennedy, when Kennedy gave the instruction to actually reduce the air attacks from 16 on the first day to only eight. Well, uh, arriving, as I said, to 1960, the end of 1960, the whole process of totalitarian control continued to take place. The confiscation of the big property owners. Many people say, oh, ese es el grande. A mí en más chiquito no me va a pasar nada. Well, wait and see what is going to happen. And that's what happened in 1968, that he eliminated all the private property in the ur urban areas. And, of course, the big agricultural uh, uh, enterprises of Cotter were eliminated already by 1960. And the end product is what? <coughs> that Cuba, that was the number one producer and exporter of sugar in the world, has now to import sugar to give to its people. <coughs> Cuba that had the 80% of the food for the people producing the island now has to import 80%. And by the way, the U.S. is the number one supplier of food uh, to Cuba, in case you're not aware of that. So this brings us to the situation of Pedro Pan. Pedro Pan happened, and I remember at uh, the beginning, uh, when parents were actually uh, concerned about the patria potestad. Everybody understands what that means? That actually the patria potestad, in other words, the power of the parents over the children, etc., would be eliminated. That there was going to be a law on that, uh, along that line. And that children would be 
uh, sent to the Soviet Union. Well, that never happened, formally. But informally, it did happen. When he got control, complete control of the educational system, and that happened by mid-19, uh, by May of 1961, actually all schools came into the control of the land, were confiscated, okay? And consequently, he in practice took, you can say, that part of the staff from the parents. Not by law, but by actually having only one system of education that later was expanded to all children had to go to the agricultural fields and actually permanently stay there. You can uh, uh, imagine what happened in those, uh, in those camps. One of the things that I was told uh, to uh, uh, nice Cuban girls and so forth, it says, uh, that's a, that's a disease. And that's where you get all the uh, pregnancies and so forth over there in, the, in those, uh, in those uh, uh, camps that were placed in the school. And that was the idea of Castro himself. He, was, he has been able to do whatever it pleases him without any kind of control. Well, the Pedro Pan, I think, was right. In other words, the idea was, especially after the uh, defeat of the Bay of Pigs, um, really there wasn't much that could be done. Okay, because Castro at that point uh, was able then to have operational mates, and uh, up to that point it would have implied a full invasion by the uh, American uh, military to get rid of him. Well, uh, if we look now at all this process uh, and having a fast forward uh, movement, uh, that totalitarian system, along with a very sophisticated repressive system, and this is one of the contributions I think that we made, we talk about two types of repression. The direct repression that is uh, uh, materialized with the committees of the Fences Revolution in every, in every block, the executions by the hundreds, okay, got it to the point where Castro said, when this uh, uprising of peasants in the Cambrai and throughout Cuba, they said that there were more than 8,000 persons that had taken uh, arms to actually fight uh, Castro. And he had all the advice that he needed from the Soviet Union to actually um, uh, defeat uh, in, in, in a bloody way, this uh, uh, uprising of peasants in not only Les Cambrai, but in other parts of the United States. But he relied not only in that bloody type of repression, uh, including, uh, you can say, beatings, etc., but also the indirect repression that is materialized through the system, the whole system, the economic, the educational, uh, the mobility, religion, etc., to be controlled by the government. So the individual sees himself as totally helpless and hopeless. So that's why they prefer to get into a inner tube raft and leave. And that's why your parents decided to take you out of Cuba. That was probably the best decision that they could have made. And you save yourself. <laughs> Although they may not actually visualize that at the moment they made a decision, and probably you did not realize that, but what came afterwards was really worse. Was really worse. And uh, uh, all of that depending on the will of one single man, okay? Uh, I remember reading in this book by um, Benigno, one of the survivors of the Che um, expedition in Bolivia, that were meeting in 1968 to decide about a revolutionary offensive, a revolutionaria, 
in which they were arguing whether or not they should confiscate all the small, uh, the smallest things, uh, uh, small business repairs, whatever, barber shops, okay? And uh, it was something that they did not agree. And then Juan Almeida uh, decided to take it to a vote, and the vote came to a 50-50. Imagine a 50-50 with Castro. He doesn't accept defeat in any way. And that's one of the things we show precisely in, in our uh, new version, in the English version. And you know that he uh, uh, stood in front of him and said, Ramirito, Ramirito was that saying, tell man, por mis co, and I don't want to repeat the rest, you are going to go out tomorrow and actually start confiscating all this small property. <laughs> Por misco. I used to hear that from a good friend of mine. And that's how this was implemented. So it is the will of a single, a single uh, person. Uh, as I was saying, uh, unfortunately, uh, Cubans uh, had to face that reality that they couldn't do anything. They have tried, but definitely uh, without uh, the help, the same way that Castro had the help of the Soviet Union that opened its, uh, uh, you can say, bank account and all his maritime supplies to actually help him, Cubans did not have that, unfortunately. Some people say maybe because Cubans or Cuba did not have that wealth of oil that other countries had. I'm not going to argue about that. The fact is that at this point, and especially young people, and by the way, are the ones that impressed me the most because most of the rafters were actually young and where you can find the greatest amount of non-whites, okay? And that's why we're going to see more and more of that and I have been told by people that have lived there that at this point, practically everyone wants to leave the country because they don't see anything that they can do to change the situation. I don't know if religion could do that. Eventually, we are hearing about this pilgrimage of the uh, La Virgen de la Caridad throughout Cuba. Uh, I don't know, I hope that uh, the Virgen de la Caridad uh, will have mercy of the poor Cuban people. Uh, you have seen what happened to this beautiful lady of La Dama de Blanco. In my opinion, she was murdered. She was murdered. The same way that they tried to murder Father uh, um, um, uh, excuse me now, that he just died recently uh, Muller, uh, what's the name of the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Loredo, Father Loredo. A senior moment, people, excuse me. <laughs> um, they tried to kill him because he not only became, you know, a, a, a real uh, troublesome person because of his charisma that he had with the youth, but he was always uh, uh, there praying for the uh, political prisoners, etc. Well, they tried to eliminate him first when he was put in prison in 1965 and later in the 80s when they tried to uh, uh, kill him with a truck that actually ran over him. So, my friends, uh, this is a sad story and I agree uh, again, 100% with Carlos' perspective. I think that if all of us will actually join and try to produce what I consider a vital uh, information uh, entity around the world, because I do feel very strongly that there is genuine lack of knowledge. How many of you know what a cumulative academic record is? Raise your hand. 
cumulative academic record. Ra raise your hand, raise your hand, just to make sure. Okay? Well, I can see that it's a minority. This is one of the most sinister things that they have in Cuba to control the life and the political belief and participation of the Cuban people. And not only them, but also their parents. When I ask this question in Cuban audiences that I have been able to speak to, perhaps two or three or four raise their hands. Here you have a more knowledgeable uh, audience uh, right there. So uh, it is our duty, people. Even though we might not go back to live there, it is our duty to bring freedom and democracy to that people. But remember, leadership is a crucial factor. And that's something that corresponds to us. Not to the United States, not to the United Nations, to us. To be able to work together. For some reason, we have that inability, that lack of capability to work together. I was told on Lake Valenza that uh, in a petit committee uh, in Los Angeles when he was there, uh, he said, the problem of you Cubans is that you don't have a plan and everyone wants to be president. <laughs> Thank you very much.